Hi, welcome and congratulations. It's so great to meet you and I'm so excited to know you better and, and hopefully work with you sometime. So uh, I'm now a second year assistant professor in me communication, media, climate change and environmental justice at the School of Communication. Uh, my email address is rdonald, or one word, Donald like the duck, at american.edu. And so if you have any questions, please just feel free to get in touch. Um, so I wanted to tell you what I did before the semester started, because I feel like, you know, this is that week where, I don't know, I was feeling incredibly nervous. <laughs> and uh, I was very lucky because my colleagues were there for me. So my division director showed me how to get my ID, uh, where my office and where my classroom are. If you haven't had a, a look round and know where to walk on the first day of teaching, I really highly recommend it. It just made me feel quite a lot better. Um, I also contacted the people who were teaching the same classes as me, um, who were really incredible resources. Um, I was able to look through their syllabi, talk about exercises. And the thing that people made really clear to me is that, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so if you're teaching a class that you've never taught before, really lean on your colleagues and, um, you know, benefit from the community that's there. Um, I also met up with my graduate assistant, which is really fantastic. We were able to make a, a plan for the semester. She was really interested in teaching. And so she was kind of my GATA. Uh, and uh, I also just found that incredibly helpful to having just another person in the classroom when you start, uh, but also somebody to bounce ideas off, to um, think about doing um, assignments together. Um, it was just really helpful to, to just try and build in those connections at every point. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly split up the rest of this conversation with you into three parts. So teaching, research and service. Uh, so with the teaching, that was definitely the part that I felt most nervous about. Um, and my instinct was to try and be perfect. It's kind of what I've always done. You know, when I was teaching, I'd be like, oh, well, okay, so I just have to be perfect and everything will be fine. And it turns out that's really quite a stressful way to conduct yourself. And so um, I found that the best thing I could possibly do was to be transparent with students, uh, listen to their feedback, model humanity and also healthy boundaries. Um, so for example, in the first semester, I had a family emergency. So my daughter was really sick for a month and uh, my colleagues were fantastic. Um, they offered to um, help me out if I needed teaching support, but I also told my students as much as I was comfortable what was going on so that, you know, if their assignments didn't come back perfectly on time, they knew what was happening and they were fine with it. <laughs> it was the hardest thing about it was actually telling them. Um, and um, it's also worth remembering that they're often going through a lot too. And so modeling that humanity is really important for them to see um, that you can be you know, a real human and also um, be successful and empathetic and, and bring joy. You know, there are all these things that you can do, um, you know, while you're going through other stuff too. Um, also transparency about learning goals, the reasons why they're doing particular assignments. Um, I also gave a lots of opportunities to revise that they really appreciated. And it just, you know, that, that process of transparency was something that um, the CTRL were really supportive in, in helping me think through. Um, I asked for and received uh, lots of feedback on exercises, um, uh, the syllabi from students, and they gave me tons of really great suggestions. Um, I also brought them into my research as much as possible. So if I was thinking through a concept, I'd present it to them, be like, hey, what do you think? And um, they really enjoyed that, that opportunity to be part of my thinking and research process. And it's also something that you can bring to the classroom that absolutely nobody else can. Um, so the Centre for Teaching, Research and Learning was also just a really valuable resource. Um, I did consultations with them to look through my syllabi, to discuss ideas. Um, I uh, began a process of adopting um, uh, sort of non-traditional grading and the, um, the CTRL were incredibly uh, supportive with that. There's also a, a group now on Canvas that you can join. Um, 
Uh, I also set up uh, mid-semester course analyses. So you can have somebody from CTRL come in to talk to the students about how the course is going. Um, but if you, and, and you can also use that as part of your teaching portfolio. So that was just a great thing to do first off. Um, and also, you know, part of that structure of transparency, the students really appreciated it. And I was able to implement, you know, changes that, that made a difference to their learning as well. Um, next semester, I'm going to be taking part in what well, I'm going to be teaching um, a core um, class. So that's something that you can look into too. You apply and the committee um, uh, assesses your application. And so I'm going to be teaching my own class on how um, climate change can be thought of as a local story. Um, and, and that's another place that I'm going to be bringing my research. Um, also, I would really suggest you make sure you know who to talk to if a student is struggling. So their academic advisors are fantastic resources for students. There's also academic coaching that they can do half an hour a week. Um, and um, there are many other support services available. So if a student is struggling, you don't have to deal with that alone. Um, there are a lot of um, people in your department who are there to help you with that. Um, in terms of research, so um, I found that finding centers on campus um, was, was really helpful. So I'll just tell you some of the ones that I spoke to. So there's the Center for Environment, Community and Equity, CC. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> the uh, Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. Uh, recipes, which deals with sustainable food systems. There's a Center for Media and Social Impact, so I'm going to be leading a study for them on the impact of environmental documentaries on the protagonists. Um, and um, this is just one way that you can really plug into a lot of really cool interdisciplinary projects that, that span the departments in the, in the school. Um, and it's also been a way for me to, so, so my research was very much locally focused and I did it on Miami, which is a very different place to Washington DC. So being able to connect with those networks has helped me think about how to transfer sort of locally based research and how I can use some of those ideas, but, but really think about the local context. Um, there are tons of opportunities for mentoring, uh, so I'd really suggest you speak to just as many people as possible to understand your division and your department better. Uh, my department also has regular meetups for tenure track faculty and tenure track and tenured faculty, so to really demystify the tenure process, help you talk through things that are concerning you. Um, you know, am I doing it okay? <laughs> But then they'll they'll let you know you're, you're probably doing fine. Um, also, the National Center for uh, Faculty Development and Diversity is a really fantastic resource. So um, you are automatically a member. You can use all their tools. Um, the 14 day writing sprints are fantastic. Um, so you just go and you log your time. And for some reason, it's just really helpful. Um, and you can talk to other people. You can just choose to, you know, just just log half an hour of, of um, writing every day. Um, you can apply for the faculty success program. So I um, successfully applied last semester. So I'm starting that um, uh, next week. Uh, and so that's a way of helping you to, you know, just just learn how to balance all of the different commitments that you have. Um, talking about the the uh, kind of trumpeting the successes of AU, I did um, uh, media training as well last semester, um, and that's something that your department uh, may put you forward for, but it's also something you can ask about, I'm sure. Uh, and then finally, service. I found that was another just really fantastic way to connect with people across your department and across campus. So um, I worked on... Um, helping to add DEI principles into the uh, guidelines for uh, tenure and promotion. So it felt like I was doing something really important. Um, but also, you know, things like your support of students, um, writing um, uh, recommendation letters, all of the things that you do as part of um, being a mentor, that also counts as service. Um, and so, um, you know, really thinking about service as a way to um, give back to the community, but also there are many ways that you can be recognized. Um, so I just wanted to end by um, just encouraging you to, to connect with each other, connect with the people in your department, people who are on tenure track, people who are tenured, um, because you can all help each other out. Um, so thank you very much.
They went down the slide. Oh, yes. Good morning. Yeah. You guys sounding like you have tons of coffee at the back and you sounding like good morning. Now, yeah. I know there is some energy in the room. It's my own way of welcoming you here to American University. I'm a second year faculty here in the School of International Service. And I remember at the end of orientation, one of my colleagues who teaches international development said, Sam is going to be the guy the students will hate and love. The reason for that is I teach stats. Yeah, so I teach quantitative research methods. Obviously, people don't like to play with numbers. You do. But I tell my students, if you can play with money, you have interest in numbers. Money is numbers, right? That is why we want a 10 billion over a $1. All right. So, but it's been a year of fun, as you can tell. A lot of learning experiences has been going on. And so when I was asked to do this, I asked myself, when you were going in, how did you think about the challenges you were going to encounter and how you prepared for it? It was something that went like this. First, expectations. I'm an overly ambitious person. Coming to American University, I met my counterparts in the classroom. The students here are overly ambitious and they wear it on their sleeves. They want to change the world. You get that on the very first day. That was my own experience. But in as much as they want to change the world, they come to it too with humility. So they expect you, the faculty leader, to be that guy post because you are coming from the world. And apparently, given my own international experience, working as a reporter in a conflict setting like Liberia, working for the United Nations, students came to the classroom with a lot of applications from that experience. And I thought of causing conflict and development. I remember a student coming up to me one day for office hours, and I asked her, I said, look, what's going good, what's going wrong? She said, I've been reading about you, but you don't come across like that in the classroom. <laughs> what she was really saying was that Sam be Sam. Do not be humble. Tell us about the challenges. And students like that. They like that a lot. They also expect you not to be a soft or a hard person. So it means we've got to find a balance between the kind of activities and assignments we give to them. How much more minutes do I have? 10, 20? No, 10. All right. And that comes along with the question of governance. One term that I've heard, and it was used this morning, was the question of shared governance. Students are willing to help you govern them. So she talked about having students do something like a mid-semester evaluation. And for me, I say it's a continuous process. The first day of class, especially my stats class, apart from my conflict and development class, I always ask students, how do you want to be taught? And you'd be surprised about the tons of ideas they have. They know what they want. They know how they want it. So they're able to guide you knowing that, I mean, I'm a younger guy, but I still feel that I come from a different generation. I was a guy who was into AI. So they come with that expectation, so they are able to advise, suggest ways of you teaching them. And for me, I do it continuously. I graduated from George Mason School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And one thing I learned there was the importance of mid-semester evaluation. In the middle of the semester, faculty will leave the room, and the student is designated to just ask two questions. What's going right? What's not going right and needs to be changed? And you'll be amazed when you step back in the room, the tons of ideas you find on the board. And so for me, I see syllabus as a continuously production process. Based on these ideas, I go back and tweak the syllabus, not necessarily changing the entire content, but your own approach, how you conceptualize the course. Hell, she has offered tons of ideas. 
The faculty here are very, very welcoming. It's a family. Just ask a question and there will be someone who will be willing to provide you a direct answer or someplace where you can find help. When I came, the first question I had was this expectation of students and my, my, the head of the, the program at the time I went to him, I said, look, what's going on here? What do I expect? He said to me, Sam, don't come to this class expecting that you're teaching students who did economics. Our students are of this type. They are slow learners or they are ambitious. And he was able to identify a lot of resources that was helpful in me getting started. So I will stop here so as not to be too repetitive. Take your questions. We could uh, have questions for both of our speakers. So just tell us who you want to ask a question and raise your hand online as well. If you have questions, our Zoom audience. Thank you. Thank you both. Yes. I have just a practical question. So I started teaching right when COVID hit um, and then I went back to practice. But because it was COVID, that's my experience. It was basically online or me in a fairly empty classroom. Um, can you talk about the balance of, of what students expect with regard to technology and how flexible we are, how much they you've sensed them wanting to be in the classroom versus really wanting that flexibility? And also with exams or turning things in, like how do you, where do we stand in that continuum? I guess I'm just curious your perspectives. You wanna go first? Uh, I think that it's, I don't think there are any hard and fast expectations from students. I think that they're nervous, but happy to be in the classroom again. I'm teaching one hybrid course uh, this semester, uh, but the rest will be in person. Um, and I don't think that they expect technology just for the sake of it. Um, they want it to do something. Um, and um, it's a great thing to get feedback on. Um, I tried a couple of different platforms and things like that, and students kind of weren't keen on either of them. Uh, and so I just dropped them and we we carried on doing doing um, you know, things differently. Uh, so I think like if you want to use a technology, use it with a, for a reason and don't feel like you have to be kind of doing something just because students expect it. Um, they really just, want to to do well and um they, i don't think they care so much how yeah just towards that and i've just closed a session on stars teaching online using zoom the students are always willing to engage in fact they are on the platform before me but it's about finding creative ways to make them feel comfortable on the platform to remain engaged i taught COVID, during the, COVID, the earlier years of COVID, when I was an adjunct at Delaware State, the experience there was quite a little bit different compared to here. Again, at the time I was teaching stats, numbers again that people don't like. And what I found was the way my platform now is set up, I have this thing called document camera that I can use, like the way we use the whiteboard in the classroom, the white sheet to project. That is one thing I've added to my menu now, and it has been very, very useful, which I think would have been better during the early semester, the earlier years of COVID. So it's about finding creative ways to make the platform attractive for students. And you do have to make it still. I'm a guy who like to laugh, so I like to throw out crazy jokes. They are also responsive the same way like in a normal classroom setting. And I say that because except one student, the two sessions I taught this semester, I didn't lose anybody. And the one student left after the second week because of some other family problems. So that tells you that, hey, people want to stay. They are adapted to the platform more than you expect or think. I hope that answered your question. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Craig French. I'm joining the government department uh, this semester where I teach political theory. Um, my question is for Rosalind and Sam both, because I think you touched on this in your comments. 
Um, I've been out of the classroom for a few years, and uh, I'm nervous about the uh, the mood uh, of the students because when I last taught a few years ago, I was beginning to notice signs of sort of people feeling adrift. Students were often struggling with mental health issues um, and feeling a little overwhelmed by things going on off campus and on campus. Um, my worry, speaking to colleagues recently in the last couple of weeks, is that some of the things I noticed a few years ago have perhaps gotten possibly even a little more acute over the last couple of years. So if you could both of you just say um, something about how you find your students, what motivates them, what doesn't, and what they are struggling with that faculty could possibly help with. Thank you. That's a good question. My first semester, I had a student that had some mental breakdown in class. One thing I can show you off, there are tons of resources also on those campus for that. In fact, I didn't know she came to class, I was lively until I got a notification from student affairs. But what I was able to do was to treat her as a special case. All right, so I was able to call her, we sat down, we talked one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, in fact, there were two students. We talked one-on-one, -on -one, each of them, and we, I, with them, we developed a special plan on how they could succeed and how they could navigate the semester for that particular course. And that was earlier in the semester. Towards the end of the semester, I think it was around two weeks before a final exam, a student also had another problem. So you have to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. And they are always willing, once you can engage them, that is what I noticed. If you don't engage them, they can tend to shy away. Right? But once you can engage them, they are always willing and open. So working with you to help them address their needs. I definitely know what you mean. And so what I try and do is build into my teaching just constant reminders that it's okay to feel like that. Um, I talk about my own feelings again as much as you know is appropriate. So talking about feeling nervous on the first day. I tell them when I've had to ask for an extension on a deadline um, because everybody has to do it. Uh, it's not a personal failing, um, but just you know having the courage to to get in contact and let you know. Something I'm going to try out this semester is a, a form that students can fill in to let me know if they if they need some accommodations. Um, so they don't have the maybe the initial fear of of getting in touch. So I think something that COVID has done is is make it very scary to talk to people, especially people who feel kind of like they're in authority. Even if you're someone like me, who is really not a scary person, there's still something scary about it. And so um, I just try and make sure that there are about 15 different doors open to them. Um, and I uh, make it very clear that um, meeting with me in person is important. So it's something that I build into their grade. Um, I also try and make sure that they know and practice second chances, because something that I really see is like, they feel like they have one shot to do almost, you know, and then then it's over. They keep like, and they'll tell me things like, I feel like it's too late for me to, I'm just like, okay, you're 19. Okay, let's start from there. Okay, there are many times you will feel like you failed and it's okay, but the, I think that the pressure on them is very high. You know, the stakes feel very high. They're supposed to have done so many different things by the time they finish university now. I, I did one internship and it had absolutely nothing to do with what I wanted to do in the future. And that's a privilege. That's something that, you know, I um, now recognize as, as, you know, one of these like amazing opportunities to grow and, I think they feel like everything has to count, everything does count and everything. So if they feel like they're falling behind, they feel like they failed and they sort of stop engaging. And so um, I'm just very annoying. And uh, I talk to them all the time about how, you know, this is a skill. This is one of the skills that we can teach is how to be resilient, how not to feel like everything's over just because you've missed a deadline. Um, and I found that their work improved a great deal once I started doing that. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there, but hopefully that helps. That's very helpful. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Shashank. I'm uh, joining the audio technology program. 
Um, so my question was for Rosalind. Uh, you said you're designing hybrid classrooms, right? So uh, um, I was wondering on that because the in-person experience is, is so much different from the Zoom experience. You were just mentioning that you um, encourage students to come and meet you in person and, and you um, include that into your uh, grading system. So then how are you planning to navigate this in-person experience uh, with you know, uh, with the Zoom experience, you know, uh, do you also fear that people might just because it's offered hybrid might just tend to stay home and just log into Zoom? And how do you encourage that? Uh, so the hybrid class means that they do um, some work asynchronously and then there is one in-person meeting per week. And so um, my plan is to make the in-person meetings really fun so they want to come in well and also they, I mean they have to come in for their grade so it's it's also um fun but compulsory <laughs> uh so I guess like what I'm trying to offer with this is um like a flipped classroom so um they do the bulk of their work um online asynchronously and then there is a way to practice it in person so say we're talking about like media framing like the way that the media weave stories about complicated issues so they'll um maybe look online find examples of like a subject that has you know that you know it's like the war on drugs you know it's that is a very specific story a way of talking about um race class and drug use um and then in person we'll go through all the stories that people have collected we might find a way of sorting them um, we'll um, look at some news broadcasts and think more about framing. So compare, so really kind of ways to put things into practice, um, things that, that they can do together that they wouldn't be able to do um, online separately. Um, and, you know, this will change over the semester as well. You know, as, as you sort of find a rhythm, you find the things that students like, they give their suggestions, which are generally excellent. Uh, and so I take them on shamelessly. Uh, so yeah, I hope that's helpful, but that's kind of how how I am thinking about it right now is that, you know, the online is how they, um, you know, on that sort of, you know, on our um, Loom's taxonomy, right? The We're starting at the bottom with, um, you know, understanding um, and, um, and we're moving up the scale as the week progresses. So they get to more creative um, uh, learning by the end of the week. Speaking of hybrid, do we have any questions from the Zoom audience? Feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. It is harder to engage the online audience, isn't it? No pressure. <laughs> Sounds great, that's it. All right, anyone in the room? We have time for about two more questions. Can I ask a question? Is there anything you wish you would have done differently? Uh, I think I would have cared less about looking like, well, again, like sort of seeming perfect at the beginning, like with, with colleagues and with students. Um, so just being able to go with questions and, or if, or if there's something I'm concerned about, something I want to talk through, because um, like I've always come back with so many more ideas, feeling so much less stuck. Um, and so, you know, it's a way to build community as well with your students, with your colleagues, um, you know, they really want to help you, but they don't necessarily know, um, how to, without you asking. So just kind of, you know, not being afraid to be vulnerable in that way, I think was, um, the best thing I could have learned. Yeah, that's, that's the thing I think I would have changed. I don't know what I can change that about myself. It's not coming to the class with an expectation of perfection. And that's my nature. It's sad. My nine-year-old has the same thing, so I worry about her every day. She doesn't like to see her grades, and she's dropping below A. The first question she will ask, Daddy, are you proud of me? Yeah. So that's my nature. It's something I wish I could change, 
not coming to the classroom with that assumption of perfection. But there's a danger to it too, because you could drop standards, and which is what I'm always afraid of. I always tell my colleagues, look, the school has a particular set of standards that we must all aspire to. And that is why the students come to our classes is because of that expectation. So I always have to fight to maintain it. So it's always that difficult kind of balance, but that's me. So I think like the way that I thought about it is being rigorous, but flexible. There are many ways to be excellent, which is what inclusive excellence I think kind of is really about too, is, is you know, how do you, give people many opportunities to be excellent and recognize it as well. And I think that that just, just yields its own dividends. Thank you so much for those thoughtful answers. This is a, like a sidebar to the coming into the classroom with perfection. And, and over time, like I've, I've, shifted to where I just want to be myself when I want to be in dialogue and, and that really creates a sort of a co-learning really comfortable there mm -hmm. however when you're talking about perfect the part that makes me crazy nervous is being up to speed on all of the appropriate diversity equity inclusion mm -hmm. and like that part I get like I don't I don't know I don't want to make an error because I could I could hurt or offend somebody and I don't know how to be open about that as a learning experience for me too. So I just wonder if you face that and then how to really equip to not, to not be too uptight, not try so hard to be perfect in that realm. So. Before coming here, I decided to go back and look over the course evaluations. And there was a comment that came across, not in a bad way, but highlighted it. But what I know is something I'm already sensitive about, given the kind of environment we're working in, given the context I come from. So I always come to the classroom with this humility. So it's always a difficult topic, for example, to discuss gender in conflict, especially from a male. I'm leading that discussion. So the first thing I always tell students is, hey, please, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. For a moment, I'm going to pretend to be this boy who was living in a house with two other boys. So it's going to be a boy on boy stuff. But know that I love my mother so dearly, and I also love my nine-year-old. So if I were to say something that sounds offensive, please forgive me. But it's about recognizing that humility. And because of that, I try to get away from being so much of a leader on a particular issue, given its sensitivity. And so I always try to bring in guest lecturers to lead it, and which also caused me trouble last semester. Because two semesters ago, I invited my good friend, Lima Bowie, to speak to my class on gender and conflict, the Nobel Prize winner from Liberia. And students came last semester to my conflict and development class, expecting to see Lima, and Lima didn't show up. But it's just about having that sensitivity and being humble about it, recognize the potential for failures and, and state it openly. The students are very much welcoming to that, I think. Um, I'd highly recommend the CTRL's resources. I think they also have um, workshops on that coming up. Um, and it's an opportunity to talk to um, other faculty um, and also to just learn um, and, and kind of practice. Um, and I think that that's just really helpful. Um, you know, it means that you don't feel kind of unprepared going into the classroom. I also just try and, I just try and reflect too, um, see where, you know, something might have, um, you brought something up for me. You know, I think that that's, um, it's really helpful to be reflective and just also to, you know, see what, see what's out there, how you can learn first um so that you feel um ready when you go into the classroom you don't have to sort of go through it all by yourself um the CTRL are really fantastic at um helping you navigate diversity in the classroom um and so you know you can kind of spend some time to learn with people who are there to help you and who are equipped to help you do that Thank you so much, Sam and Rosalind. We're at time, actually. And so wonderful having you here. And we're going to move to the next.